So, um, very fittingly for uh, conference on MPT, um, I'm invited from Ireland, uh, Marvin Driscoll, who's been working on this and other um, Irish diplomacy problems. Um, I met Marvin for the first time, uh, that was March, yeah, in Dublin. It was my first visit to Ireland, and uh, we had lunch together. How did we spend an hour or so? And it was already enlightening about, you know, learning about the neutral's point of view, and it was quite different from what you would expect from a country like Germany or Japan, who's always looking up to the US and thinking, what would the US do, what should we do? It's a, always a function of the US foreign, foreign policy, what we do. And uh, yes, um, well, we discussed several things, but we thought Ireland would be a very good uh, country to start the conference with. So with that, um, Marvin, you have the floor, and you have about 45 minutes. sponsorship of a variety of UN resolutions and so on. As the president of the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference in 1985 and the author of the first history of the NPT, Mohammed Shaker noted, quote, it was in response to Irish endeavors in the United Nations in the years 1958 to 61 that a concept of non-proliferation of nuclear weapons was laid down. Um, in the United Nations General Assembly Resolution. This concept served as a guide to successive steps within and outside the United Nations with the intention of arresting proliferation. Now, most publications on the origins of the NPT directly mention this early period of Irish advocacy. Um, interestingly, they reveal little about Irish motivations in this germinal phase, and they take them for granted I will talk about that first, but I don't wish to reconstruct the narrative of how the Irish efforts resulted in securing a unanimous adoption in 1961 of the so-called Irish Resolution by the General Assembly, as my main focus is the under-researched area um, of the first MPT review conference in May 1975 in its background. Now, using Ireland as a case study, I would argue that neutrals and small states' contribution to the first 
NPT review conference, while less than distinctive than the contributions in the late 1950s and the early 1960s, were nonetheless important in establishing the credibility of the Non-Proliferation Treaty as a functioning instrument of international society. Ireland's conduct in the preparation for and role at Non-Proliferation Review Conference in May 1975 demonstrated Irish policy, quote, has always been incremental and pragmatic since the dawn of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Now, let me turn to the original motivations. Ireland's positions on many international questions in the late 1950s were idiosyncratic. It perplexed its neighbours. Its positions were littered with paradoxes that defied simple explanation to outsiders, unfamiliar with its national formation, political history and culture. Why, after all, would Ireland, a semi-demilitarised pygmy, effectively an unarmed neutral, with no nuclear weapons ambitions or nuclear industry, energize and persist with nuclear non-proliferation from the 1950s. <coughs> now, Ireland, as I see, in the late 1950s was semi generous. Its neutrality had only emerged at the outbreak of World War II. Few observers had observed or had expected that it could sustain that neutrality, since to all intents and purposes, it was well, particularly from Washington, after America was forced into the war after Pearl Harbor. It was the only dominion in the British Commonwealth not, uh, that was not prepared to fight for the Allies. Uh, this tendentious issue of Irish neutrality can be traced back to a number of discrete factors in the late 1930s. The failure of the collective security system of the League of Nations and the resulting Irish disenchantment with multilateralism. The partition of the islands as a justification for not allying with Britain as an occupier of part of the island. Then there was Ireland's involuntary membership of the British Commonwealth as a result of a war of independence. And then there was Irish defencelessness before and during World War II. After a bloody civil war, the Irish no longer trusted their army, so they reduced it to a pygmy status, in effect in the 1925-1926. Um, <clears throat> the chief architect of neutrality was undoubtedly the Prime Minister, or in Irish terms, Taoiseach, Eamon de Valera, who held the portfolio of external affairs after 1932. Um, there was a popular consensus in favour of neutrality in 1939 to ensure survival, and that gained hold um, uh, had gained hold in the latter part of the 1930s. Now, this neutrality impulse uh, was reinforced by the so-called emergency. That is a term that the Irish government coined the period of its neutrality during World War II. It didn't call it neutrality, it called it an emergency. It was aided by a remorseless system of censorship to prevent any partiality developing in the general population towards either of the belligerents. The Irish population, excluding the estimated three to 400,000 in Britain, either fighting in the British Armed Forces or working in the British war economy, was largely insulated from the war. The Irish media were pre prevented from making judgments about the justice of either the Allied or the Axis causes, and thereby questioning neutrality, uh, which would have mar mortally endangered the domestic uh, domestic integrity of neutrality. Neutrality as declaratory government policy was unanimously supported from the outset of the war by all democratic political parties. That was remarkable, considering the bitter political hatreds which had polarized the Irish political party system. As a result of the 1922 to 1923 civil war, which follows the war of independence, now, there is a strong case to be made that neutrality was implemented in 1939 for overwhelmingly pragmatic reasons. Um, although the survivalist instincts were permeated by a sense of a need to demonstrate national independence from Britain. Um, but once the war turned against Germany and the Axis during 1942 and 1943, pragmatism 
was to overtaken by nationalist ideological impulses. As, and as search to differentiate Ireland from Britain and laud Irish virtues, portraying neutrality as a, neut as a moral policy based on national self-respect. That was accentuated by um, the Anglo-American press and by the American diplomat to Ireland, David Gray, who endeavoured to convince de Valera to abandon neutrality in a public war of words and war in print, which pitted the Allies fighting a so-called just war against de Valera, who played the role of defender of Irish national and neutral virtues in an unequal propaganda war. The Allies won the international propaganda war, forever colouring international opinion of Irish neutrality. But the Irish government won the domestic one, convincing the Irish population of the rights of their case, uh, leading to a dichotomy. Um, <clears throat> neutrality in an Irish situation, and by extension, any of those uh, perceptions associated with it, metaphors, meta metamorphosed into a shibboleth in the 1950s and 1960s in Irish collective memory, and acted as a restraining influence on Irish foreign policy more by accident than by design. It was only intended, neutrality was only intended to exist for a war. Because uh, what has happened? The success of Irish wartime neutrality consolidated the strong sense of the Irish into the state that had been formed from a revolution against the British Empire and then in a civil war in the early 1920s. There was no certainty in 1945 that Ireland would continue neutrality afterwards. Surprisingly, and against expectations, it rejected membership of NATO in 1949. But that was not based on any sense of neutrality. Rather, it was due to an inexperienced, pro-American, and deeply anti-communist foreign minister who believed he could gain American assistance to persuade Britain to end partition in return for Irish membership of NATO. Nothing to do with neutrality. That same dysfunctional government, dysfunctional government of which <coughs> Sean McBride, that foreign minister, foreign minister has spoken of, that same dysfunctional coalition government unpredictably left the British Commonwealth that year in controversial circumstances and declared a republic in 1949. As is frequently the case, once a major but surprising political decision is made, even when it is accidental, unintended, or ill-considered, it changes the course of politics and foreign policy. Just consider the impact of British Prime Minister David Cameron's decision to hold the Brexit referendum. <laughs> but to return to Ireland, contrary to its Republican separatist narrative, it chose to follow the British lead of not joining the European Economic Community in the 1950s, and it remained a British economic dependent. Entry to the United Nations was achieved late, in December 1955, when the Soviets dropped their veto against Irish entry. Until then, Ireland was an insular backwater obsessed with partition, and used partition as the basis to justify non-membership of NATO much to the bewilderment of its Western neighbours. UN membership was the first opportunity for Ireland to gain any international influence or voice since the 1930s. Now, this brings me to the interwar period. Quick flip back. During the interwar period, Ireland had adopted a good citizen international posture at the League of Nations during the 1920s and nations. Eamon de Valera, Dennis Taoiseach repeatedly, constructively criticized the organization for not fulfilling its international liberal ideals and the League Covenant. This experience of activism and the collapse of the idealist international vision played a formative role, it would seem, in informing Eakin's approach to the United Nations. In the late 1950s, Irish foreign policymakers held a clear self-perception that they were rejoining the international community after being out in the cold for two decades, after uh, in a period of enforced absence. And key Irish policymakers, such as Eakin and probably de Valera, 
wish to benefit from that and inform that enterprise, believing that Ireland had a unique contribution to make. Aiken was appointed the Minister for External Affairs in 1957, and he was clearly heavily influenced by a blend of Irish democratic republicanism, internationalism, and a sense of small statehood that was in line with what his political master, Eamon de Valera, then Taoiseach, Taoiseach in the whole period from 1942 to 1949, and again from 1957 to 59, um, which De Valera had practiced at the League in the early 1930s. By conviction, Eakin was a fervent advocate of Irish neutrality during World War II. He had unapologetically protected wartime neutrality as a minister for defensive coordination during the Second World War. Notably, he implemented the Irish government's policy of draconian censorship, which we've already spoke about. Um, he was an ardent conviction statesman. He was a former revolutionary of the War of Independence, back in, from 1919 to 1921. He'd fought in the Irish Civil War. But he held a liberal conviction that Ireland, a former colony and a member of um, no alliance and a positive contribution to make at the United Nations and to improve in the international atmosphere based on the rule of law, consensus building, peace, equality of race, and parity of all states. And that, this was undermined or underpinned by his principles, anti-imperialism, which comes from his Irish republicanism, and a healthy skepticism of great power politics, and an independent small state mindset. That led him to criticize both Cold War blocs and to judge issues on their independent merits. Notwithstanding, Ireland's status as a free society, possessing a British parliamentary democratic tradition and political culture, and, a, and strong pro-American instincts, owing to an extensive history of Irish immigration to the new world. The Catholicism of most of its citizens was deeply anti-communist, to such a degree that the Irish state refused to respond to all Soviet advances to exchange diplomats until the late 1970s. And the CIA and MI6 apparently considered Ireland as a bulwark against communism during the Cold War. There is some reason to believe that it continued secret and selective intelligence sharing with the American and British intelligence agencies during the Cold War, a practice that had commenced during the Second World War. So, full of paradox. Let's turn now to uh, the Security Council situation um, in the late 1950s, in which Ireland and Frank Aiken reacted. The Security Council remained great locked at this stage by Cold War bloc politics. Um, but the irony here is that Ireland gained membership of the Security Council, or gained membership of the United Nations in the first place in 1955 as a barter deal between the East and Western blocs. And it was allowed in as part of the, a pro-American bloc in exchange for Soviet satellites. Um, the, the Security Council remained gridlocked by Cold War bloc politics, leaving the initiative to self-proclaimed middle powers and neutrals in the late 1950s, who could act as mediators and also appeal to the growing mem uh, number of newly independent states of Africa and Asia. Aiken evidently estimated that Ireland had a necessary moral authority uh, to act. On this basis, the, uh, the Irish historiography categorizes Irish diplomacy um, in this period from 1957 to 1961 as a golden age, when Ireland gained a certain notoriety as a pro-Western state in terms of values, but one that was nonetheless a maverick in terms of global security, um, which irritated the members of the Western alliance system. Frank Aiken was single-minded in making impudent and conspicuous initiatives, of which the non-proliferation uh, or non-dissemination Irish resolution was just one. He proposed, for example, much to the distress of his uh, Western neighbors, military withdrawals in Central Europe and the Middle East, which upset Germans no end, 
Um, he espoused discussion of mainland China's representation at the UN. He criticized Peking over Tibet. He condemned South African apartheid, which was not popular in Western society at this stage. He promoted decolonization, and he commenced Ireland's involvement in peacekeeping. No small feat in a short period of three or four years, managing to upset everyone at various points. Uh, so he irritated his Western European um, and American friends and neighbors, the Soviets, the Chinese, um, the major powers. He told the General Assembly, but how did, why did Ireland get involved in non-proliferation? He told the General Assembly in 1958 that in the atomic age, a general war threatened to annihilate the, war, the world. This was the most pressing issue in international affairs, and all states the right and duty to avoid that possibility, even Ireland. And the time frame is critical. As this was a low point in the Cold War following the launch of Sputnik, the talk of American missile gaps, Khrushchev's saber rattling, concerns about the fallout from nuclear testing, and general paranoia prevailing, particularly in the Western world. Even Ireland could not remain detached. As its neighbor, Britain, uh, was a Soviet target, it hosted US medium range ballistic missiles. While general disarmament was preferable, Eakin realized it remains too ambitious. He was a pragmatist, um, stating that, quote, while we all wish for complete nuclear disarmament, we must confront the terrible fact that it is quite vain to expect it in the immediate future, unquote. Therefore, the way forward was to limit dissemination with the nuclear club making common cause with humanity, um, as the worst case scenario would be, as he said, exponential nuclear weapons to the existing nuclear club in the interim until general disarmament was possible and a test ban treaty to make it difficult for new aspirants to enter the nuclear club and for environmental and health reasons. So therefore, from 1958 to 1961, Frank Aiken engaged in patient realist diplomacy, as he saw it, seeking to make common cause between the nuclear powers and the soon-to-be nuclear power, France, recognizing that they were critical uh, to the broader global security and proliferation situation. That approach was advantageous when combined with persistence and gradualism. Over a period of four years, he and a very small group of our, um, an Irish diplomatic team displayed negotiating skills to insert nuclear non-proliferation for the first time on the United Nations agenda, and then to construct a broad coalition of rather unlikely bedfellows in favor of the initiative. Now, I don't want to reconstruct the history of those initiative <coughs> resolutions, because that's not really my, my core objective here. What I want to do is uh, move forward quickly to the 1970s. But let me say, in relation to the period after 1961, from 1961 up to 1968, <coughs> the negotiation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty at that stage moved into the realm of superpower diplomacy, as nuclear powers engaged, particularly the United States, engaged in heavy work in of, of making the non-proliferation treaty a political reality once they realized that non-proliferation was advisable and feasible. They also agreed to partial test ban in 1963, and uh, Ireland's pioneering role was acknowledged when Frank Aiken was requested to become the first signatory of the treaty in 1968. Ireland was also granted the honor of becoming the first state to deposit its, its instrument of ratification. Now, surveys of Ireland's international action tend to regard Irish activity on nuclear non-proliferation generally as a feature of the golden age of Irish diplomacy at the United Nations from 1957 to 1961, and closely connected with the preferences and personality of Frank Aiken. Undoubtedly it was. In general, on the rare occasions when where comment is offered on the Irish role after 1961, it is noted that, quote, the single-mindedness and sense of achievement associated with Irish involvement in disarmament has become less apparent, unquote, according to uh, Richard Sinnott. It is, of course, clear that Ireland adapted at this stage, in the 1960s, to what might be termed the Western mainstream leading to its retreat from economic protectionism and joining, ultimately, the European Economic Community in 1973. 
the priority of Irish economic modernization and the attendant need for approval by the Euro-Atlantic Club of States overshadowed Ireland's, I would say, earlier global citizen sort of discourse to a degree. It would be incorrect, nevertheless, to conclude that Ireland's interest in promoting disarmament and non-proliferation dissolved, did not vanish, as Ireland continued to pursue an international order based on consensus and norm building, which is often forgotten about. As Noel Dorr, who's a former Secretary General of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, has noted, Ireland in the 1970s was heavily involved in the intricate business of assisting, advising, and co-drafting many UN resolutions, especially on disarmament. Although Dorr is correct in saying that, quote, the number of resolutions uh, was inversely proportional to the level of success they achieved, unquote. That is only part of the equation. Um, the diplomacy scholar R.P. Barton's work quoting here, he's argued, quote, that the principal normative objective of diplomacy from a multilateralist perspective is contribution to the creation of universal rules, unquote. Barton might have extended his observation, in my estimation, to include universalization, implementation, and perpetuation of rules and international agreements contributing to a regulated and peaceful international society based on consensus. Such work occurs daily to make agreements live in reality. This detail of painstaking multilateral work is largely inconspicuous, self-effacing, but in working closely with similar-minded states, Ireland assisted in embedding a new norm of non-proliferation in international society in the 1970s. Let's have a look at what I mean here. Um, Ireland's long-standing line favours nuclear disarmament. As Conor Crimmon, the uh, Irish Permanent Representative, informed the United Nations General Assembly in 1973, Ireland supported, quote, any constructive and effective measures contributing to the cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date. The nuclear disarmament and general and complete disarmament uh, were desired under strict and effective international control. Quote. It regarded the Non Proliferation Treaty as, quote, one of the most valuable international, treaty, uh, international agreements in the field of disarmament. Unquote. The key objective was the still wider acceptance of the obligations of the treaty in the first instance. So, Ireland's objective, as far as one can reconstruct it in the early 1970s, was uh, leading up to the review conference in 1975 was not to perfect the treaty at all costs or to engage in renegotiating it and adding amendments or regulations that would jeopardize the state treaty by disassembling the core compromises. As Irish official sources make abundantly clear in 1974-1975, the approach was that the NP NPT was inherently weak and fragile. <coughs> The result of a delicately balanced compromise. So therefore, the review conference, the first review conference, was, quote, crucial, not simply in terms of the continued credibility of the non-proliferation treaty, but indeed in terms of its continued existence, unquote. Ireland, as we said, is pragmatic, incremental, non-proliferationist, but ultimately is a general and complete disarmament um, activists, according to its diplomats, based on its track record and, and general approach. The Non-Proliferation Treaty was less than ideal from the Irish perspective, but it was all that there was. Um, and therefore, you can argue, looking at the evidence, that Ireland and its collaborators acted as guardians of the treaty. Now, the NPT re rested on a delicate bargain between the nuclear weapon <coughs> states and the non-nuclear weapon states. It was a nebulous framework, a catch-all treaty. Its wording pushes the boundaries of constructive ambiguity to its limits. The treaty did not have clearly defined enforcement mechanisms, a means for punishing non-compliance, or a withdrawal clause. There was no harmonious understanding of how the NPT was to operate. Now, these ambiguities made the negotiation 
and ratification processes easier in the 1960s, states could subjectively interpret it domestically to get the political will to ratify it. Conversely, that would lead to diverse expectations after it was ratified and then implemented, um, which had been managed if the treaty was to grow into an effective international instrument. The 1975 Review Conference was a manifestation of these divergent interpretations. It displayed a deep divide between the nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon states, especially when the non-aligned, led by Mexico, proposed additional protocols amounting to a renegotiation of the non-proliferation treaty. These protocols were a criticism of the nuclear weapon states for the non-fulfillment of the vague disarmament Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and they prescribed solutions. The non-aligned viewed progress on horizontal non-proliferation as contingent on vertical non-proliferation. The infamous ambiguity and lack of a disarmament timetable in Article 6 was a key problem. Um, and it provided the non-nuclear weapon states with a line of attack at the review conference. The non-aligned and the group of 77 also claimed the moral high ground by arguing that disarmament would release funds for economic development in the disarmament decade. The nuclear weapons states resolutely refused to be dictated to. The Irish knew all of this for months in advance, two years in advance. Ultimately, in 1975, the review conference was going to teeter on the brink of collapse without even an agreed final declaration. The first review conference. The non-nuclear or the nuclear weapon states, uh, particularly uh, the North and the developed states with nuclear industries, their interests were somewhat heterogeneous. The nuclear weapon states wanted to avoid political questions of arms control and disarmament involving East-West confrontation, which were the subject of bilateral discussions, part of soft negotiations, and so on. They wished to focus instead on technical matters, such as improving safeguards, developing the International Atomic Energy Agency, and so on. <coughs> uh, the developing countries disliked this, as they feared it would lead to a showdown or a slowdown rather than a rise in nuclear power transfers to them. Remember, this was the decade of oil prices, the search for alternative energy sources, and they wanted um, civil, nuclear, civil nuclear power reactors. And they wanted assistance under the non-proliferation treaty. And they were reticent about safeguards tightening that threatened those aims. Um, and the nuclear power, the nuclear industrial powers of the North were also reticent about tightening safeguards because it threatened their competition with one another um, as they were competitors uh, for markets for their nuclear reactors after the first oil crisis. Many commentators therefore criticized the first review conference as a failure based on a weak final declaration which amounts to a nuanced restatement of the non-proliferation treaty reflecting divergent opinions. That is based on an ahistorical perspective and unrealistic expectations. It neglects to see the disagreements that were a product of the success of broken the treaty in the first place. An analysis of the first review conference illuminates the importance of the neglected role, in my estimation, of neutrals, middle powers, and small states in securing the survival of the infant non-proliferation treaty. Ireland, Sweden, Canada, Australia, and others embedded the norm and discourse of nuclear non-proliferation. The efforts of small medium states like Sweden, Canada, Australia avoided the review conference's collapse. In broking a consensus final declaration, they reaffirmed the principles of the non-proliferation treaty. As incremental non-proliferationists, loosely working together, they constructed a compromise between the aggrieved non-nuclear weapon states of the developing south and the nuclear weapon states of the north and, the, and their allies. And this group ensured his survival of the non-proliferation treaty when the arguments between uh, the two camps threatened to rob the treaty of any, any legitimacy whatsoever. Ultimately, what this, group, uh, this middle group 
of nuclear or of a neutral and small and medium power states sought to assure was survival of the non-proliferation treaty beyond its vulnerable infancy. As the histories of new treaties and new organizations reveal, international organizations reveal, most do not survive their first five or six years of operation. But the NPT did. And even with the criticisms of it, any observer must recognize that it has withstood the test of time. It remains the only commitment of the nuclear weapon states that they will disarm. It's in this light that we should analyze the first few years of the Non-Proliferation Treaty and the first review conference, and Ireland participated in the entire review conference process. And, um, and here there is an important uh, point we made. The whole NPT review conference process had to be invented in 1974 and 1975. The Non-Proliferation Treaty stipulated that a review conference should meet every five years, or five years after its entry into force, but did less. Ireland found itself as a member of the 26th State Preparatory Committee, or PREPCOM, the UN um, Western European and Other Group, or WEOC, nominated Ireland as one of its three choices among the 26 Vice Presidents of the Review Conference task with organizing the conference and its work schedule, it was also um, a member of the Review conference and, uh, uh, Conference's Drafting Committee, which attempt, attempted to salvage the treaty from the polarization uh, that I've just discussed. Um, in addition, Ireland held the European Community Presidency in the first six months of 1975 at the same time, um, and it had its traditional interest in non-proliferation. Ireland also proposed Mrs. Inga Thorson as the president of the Review Conference. She was a review politician, diplomat, experienced representative of Sweden at the UN with a strong record in international development, disarmament. Sweden was a like-minded non-proliferation state after 1970. That, that enlightened profile appealed to the developed world and to the non-aligned movement. Um, Ireland secured a first speaking slot in the plenary of the review conference, granting it moral authority and an opportunity to set the tone. It retains this honorary first speaking position in deference to Frank Aiken's groundbreaking contribution to non-proliferation debate with the Irish resolutions. So therefore, objectively Ireland occupied an intermediating role as a non-proliferation advocate with intangible and unusual positional and diplomatic <coughs> assets possessed by few of any. It was serving on the Board of Governors of the International Atomic Energy Agency at the time. It was a strong supporter of the UN Charter. It was seen as a friend of the developing world. Some of its perspectives converged to the perspectives of the South, the Group of 77 in the UN. Its neutrality, um, its anti-colonial heritage, its disarmament and pro-development uh, disposition assured a lot of strong links with that constituency, although it never wished to join the non aligned movement. It was the only European community member state that was neutral or militarily non-aligned. That granted it detailed insights into NATO thinking as part of efforts at political coordination, um, and into the thinking um, of key states with nuclear industries and nuclear weapons. Um, in particular, a nuclear weapon state which had very close relations with the United States, that is Britain, and a non-signatory nuclear weapon state, France. In fact, its service in the European Community Presidency in the first six months um, of 1975 granted it some additional influence and authority that it didn't normally have. It was ideologically anti-communist, it was yet it was above reproach, a supporter of detente, dialogue, and diplomacy. Overall, you can argue it appealed to many different audiences. Um, and it had a singular profile in comparison to most of its Western neighbors and friends, so it could move across constituencies. And um, its views were treated relatively respectfully, respectfully by diverse audiences, as was not engaged in simple block politics. Now for the Department of Foreign Affairs in Ireland in the early 1970s, the Non-Proliferation Treaty was one of the most important armament uh, agreements ever concluded according to its records. But 
from their perspective, its ultimate success could only be assured if there was universal membership and if there was full implementation of its provisions. Article 6's commitment uh, to negotiation leading to cessation of the arms race was of special importance. And the International Atomic Energy Agency had a critical role, in the Irish estimation, in securing the NPT success. Um, <clears throat> on non-proliferation, at the United Nations, Ireland had built up a practice of consultation and collaboration with Australia, Canada, New Zealand and Sweden. It maintained a close dialogue, particularly with the Canadians, on nuclear matters. This was particularly advantageous during the non-proliferation treaty with PrepCom in 1974, um, and the selection of the Canadian William H. Barton as chair um, of the first session of that preparatory uh, committee and chair of committee two of the succeeding review conference. The fact that the United Kingdom and the United States favored Barton was an additional benefit. From the Irish perspective, Canada had, quote, outstanding credentials as a non-nuclear weapon state under the Non-Proliferation Treaty, having an important nuclear industry of its own, unquote. Ireland viewed the Canadian chairman of these committees as <coughs> quote, valuable in view of the several important uh, ratifications of the NPT, quote, outstanding from NATO countries in 1974 and 1975. There were a large number of NATO countries that still hadn't ratified what they had signed. Um, in April 1975, days before the review conference, Dublin regretfully concluded that five years of operation of the NPT had done little to enhance the status of the treaty or to allay the suspicion of its opponents. The review conference is bound to be crucial, not simply in terms of the continued credibility of the NPT, but indeed of its continued existence. Now, some recent developments um, contribute to the Irish figures. Obviously, there was India's peaceful nuclear explosion in 1974, which revealed a crack in an, the NPT's containment vessel. Uh, there, was still an international, there was still no international system for conducting and safeguarding peaceful nuclear explosions. Uh, India was the first non-nuclear weapon state since the NPT signature to demonstrate that it now had the capabilities to pursue a nuclear weapons program if it, was, if it had the intention to do so. Designating the nuclear explosion as peaceful was a clever device, but it fooled no one. Um, Ireland decided the priority was to concentrate on reinforcing safeguards, as it said, because if the whole non-proliferation system is not to be blown up, by the Rajasthan explosion. There were at least 22 other threshold states deemed capable of emulating the Indian example, should they desire to do so, under the idea of a peaceful nuclear explosion. They needed reassurance that non the non-proliferation bargain remained intact. The ambiguities surrounding definition and regulation of peaceful nuclear explosions demanded a close regulation by the international community. There were, um, there were a dozen threshold states who had rejected the Non-Proliferation Treaty, or having signed it, had not yet ratified it. Or having ratified it, had not subscribed to the International Public Energy Agency safeguards under Article 3 of the NPT. Um, some of these were Argentina, Brazil, Israel, Pakistan, South Africa, Spain, and so on. Other factors didn't encourage optimism either. The French and the Chinese continued to test nuclear weapons. Despite the taunt, the superpowers continued to procure and develop new weapon systems. The Nixon administration's decision, decision to sell in 19, June 1974 commercial reactors and fuel to Egypt and Israel, who are not members of the NPT, caused enormous tension, as they would not be subject to the same safeguards as NPT members, <coughs> unfortunately. At this point, there was no convention in place that non-proliferation treaty nuclear weapon states, uh, non-nuclear weapon states would receive preferential, peaceful nuclear assistance. In contrast to non-NPT states, the U.S. action had opened up the possibility that membership of the NPT was disadvantageous to non-nuclear weapon states. A new norm had to be established and fortified; otherwise, the NPT would be undone. 
Um, so therefore, Ireland's attitudes converged with that of the nuclear weapon states, um, that membership of the non-proliferation treaty should be, should be universal, but Ireland held that non-nuclear weapon states should derive substantial benefits from the treaty, and only the nuclear weapon states could do that. For Ireland and Canada, if all, the nuclear, if all Western states possessing nuclear industries ratified the treaty, this would have a powerful demonstrative effect. However, several nuclear power state signatories had still not ratified, including several members of the European community and Japan. Doubts even persisted about whether all of Ireland's European community partners would ratify it in time for the review conference, or whether they could even attend the review conference, because they couldn't attend it unless they had ratified it. Ireland's president of the Council of the European Community had to coax some of, the, of its uh, EC partners to ratify. Uh, the, the Benelux, Italy and Germany were in the process of ratification um, and were rushing it through in the first semester of 1975. The Europeans had delayed ratification until the integrity of the Euratom safeguards was secured under a special agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency in 1973. But Italy was causing enormous fears because of its unstable parliamentary regime. Um, um, so let's have a quick look at the PREPCOM. As a framework treaty, it was left, to the, as I said, to the operative phase of the NPT to interpret um, and implement its, some, its ambiguous language. There was no manual on how to conduct it. Um, as the Irish representative informed the General Assembly in November 1973, the treaty says where and when the conference is to be held. It does not say who is or who are to convene it. It was all up for negotiation. Um, so therefore, essential preparatory work was required, and it was decided on that basis to hold a preparatory committee during 1974 to expedite it. So basically, 18 months of intense preparatory work was required. Um, it was an opportunity to be utilised, according to, to the Irish, um, to strengthen the non-proliferation treaty, to spur the many signatories to ratify the non-proliferation treaty immediately prior to the review conference. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't be able to attend. You had to enforce that. Mm. Um, so therefore, any analysis of the 1975 review conference that excludes the PREPCOM and their runoff to the review conference is to omit a significant element of multilateral activity. In my estimation, the PREPCOM um, was an intense period of creating the rules of the game for the subsequent PREPCOMs and review conferences, as was the review conference itself. Um, <clears throat> now, Ireland began at this stage to play a double game. It wasn't not a member of non aligned movements. It traditionally avoided attending non-aligned movement meetings, but accidentally, its chargé d'affaires, Donald Clark, attended the coordination meeting of non-aligned member countries um, at the PREPCOM um, in advance um, of the REVCOM. And following consultation, he continued to attend a series of meetings, the non-aligned movement, so he was able to gauge their opinion and gain insights which proved valuable in the review conference. Um, and they have fully understood, therefore, the um, non-aligned movement's position by early 1975. On the basis of this, uh, what did Ireland do at the non-proliferation um, uh, treaty review conference? The problem for Ireland was that it had to manage the expectation gaps between the non-nuclear weapon states and nuclear weapon states and cement the NPT. Basically, a successful outcome, according to its analysis, would be one that meant the review conference didn't break down in bickering. Ireland, and its like, like many partners, the Swedes, Canadians, the Australians, looked to strike a, ba a balance between nuclear weapons liturgy in regard to our, uh, implementing Article 6 obligations on one hand, and the Mexican and non aligned movements' unworkable efforts to adapt, attach additional protocols to the treaty which would have amounted to renegotiation. That would open up Pandora's box. The goal was therefore from the Irish, um, Swedes, Canadians, and Australians 
um, and New Zealanders were constrained was to build a consensus for a final document, even a very weak final document, in order to boost the credibility of the treaty. Um, and the key objective was universal membership. To achieve all of that, our early collaborated to propose practical measures and offer carefully crafted language on contentious issues to the chair, Thorson. A major concern, and let's have a look at the concrete contributions very quickly, a major concern for the non-aligned movement was the safeguards provision Article 3, that it disadvantaged them compared to non-member states because of the Nixon um, promise to Israel and Egypt. The latter could now import nuclear materials and equipment without compulsory full-scope International Atomic Energy Agency safeguards. Canadians and the Irish addressed this with their working paper on Article uh, 4 by placing emphasis on the reciprocity of obligations, i.e. clear technological benefits should be provided in exchange for the renunciation of nuclear weapons and signing the NDP. And that called for special consideration to be given to developing member states. And the Irish continue to underline increased assistance as a benefit of becoming a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. So that language is retained um, in the Review Conference final declaration. The most significant contribution comes in the form of the proposed language for the final declaration of the preamble and Articles 1 and 2 um, that was contributed to by Australia, Canada and Ireland. Specifics on this point can be illustrated by a close reading of the Irish, Canadian, Australian working paper compared to the final document. Given that this was not the only working paper that suggested text for the preamble, the Italians and the Germans also submitted separate working papers, which were not included in the final declaration. To some extent, it can be considered a valuable contribution by the Irish to the outcome. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, are we guys? I'm close to, to um, time. I'll just make a brief concluding remark. What I can say is that Ireland acted in consultation with European neutrals and other middle powers, notably Canada and Australia. It acted as a moderating influence in a polarized climate in 1974-1975 as they attempted to rescue the review conference from a public relations fiasco occasioned by diametrically opposed viewpoints. The Irish did not make grandstanding declaratory or absolute statements or put forward unimplementable proposals. They could have done so. They often did so in the United Nations. But they realized it was not the time to do so at the review conference. Instead, they worked behind the scenes gauging the mood, proposing practical language to assist the Swedish chair and delegation to extract a workable final declaration. Neither did they simply toe the Western nuclear weapon states line. In that way, they created an atmosphere more conducive to consensus and consolidation. Um, a detail sort of, I suppose, of the entire period of 1973 to 1975 is important, as that is the formative phase in setting down the rules and parameters for the shape and the conduct of successive cycles of PREPCOMs and review conferences. It's a precedent-making and constitutive process, and it marks the, the, the invention of the Non-Proliferation Treaty with you, Thank you.